I'm going to talk a little bit, very briefly, a couple of things about the camera, some things to keep in mind. What we're going to be watching is some films that were shot on the C300 with uh, this entire system, because it's not just the camera itself. We've got a series of lenses, we've got uh, some mini primes that are going to be coming out. Uh, certainly you can use EF lenses on these cameras, and um, we have our cine zooms that we announced at NAB last year. So I'll talk about that briefly. After we do the uh, behind the scenes footage from each film, we're then going to watch the films, and I'll come out and say a little bit maybe about the technology used in any particular film. We'll probably be in here for about an hour and a half, which should give us a good hour to go outside. Then you get to know us a little bit more personally, ask us particular questions following the Q&A, and do a little hands-on with <clears throat> some of the equipment that we have outside. The C300 comes in two different versions. It has an EF mount, and the EF being our SLR mounts that you find in 5D, 7Ds. Uh, one of the advantages of this is there's over 50 compatible EOS lenses. Uh, we have a lot of specialty lenses, fish eyes, macros, tilt shift lenses, things that aren't necessarily available uh, on a lot of other camera systems. Uh, even extreme telephotos as high as 800 millimeters. And of course, PL mount lenses are the de facto cinema standard for many years now. Uh, there's several reputable manufacturers. Uh, they're familiar and they're commonly used throughout the cinema world. The imaging core of this system is really at the heart of what makes the picture quality so good and has a lot to do with a lot of the advantages of using this system. We've got our new super 35 millimeter sensor this particular CMOS sensor we're going to talk about in some detail in between some of the films uh, because the technology is very new and it's very unique in terms of single sensor cameras. Uh, we also have our Digic DV3 processor. Our processor has a lot to do with how we can have a very easy to use codec, uh, a very simple kind of recording media, and a very easy workflow and still produce the kind of visual results that we get from this system. And Finally, then we have our Canon XF codec, which works as the final be-all and end-all of delivery for your content. The remarkable low-light performance, uh, which we kind of really impacted the world with low-light when we came out the, with the 5D Mark II. We're continuing with that and putting it in more of a comfortable form factor for the traditional filmmaker. Uh, we have a wide dynamic range. You'll hear a lot of discussion about the codec, as I already mentioned. Um, our Canon Log Gamma, which I'll talk about a little bit, uh, log gamma is kind of a feature that if you really need an in-depth explanation of it, you're probably not going to use it. But if you already know what it is, you're going to be happy to have it. Um, wireless remote metadata control, which is kind of a unique feature. You'll see that in one of the behind the scenes footage. That's sort of exciting. Um, it's got affordable and versatile recording media, CF cards. Um, multiple frame rates, including 2398 and straight 24, the same as film. You'll hear that mentioned, though, it wasn't used in any of these films. And you'll see that there's major NLE support. There's different NLE system used on every single one of these films. Uh, well, two of them may have used the same, but all of the three major, Adobe, Apple, and Avid, have all been used in the films that you're going to see. Now, the C300 is an HD camera. It shoots in 1920 by 1080 resolution. A lot of times, on a full-length feature, they'll use things that are 2K or 4K or even 5K at some times. Uh, I think that Max's back really demonstrates the ability to use this camera as the primary camera on an appropriate feature. Um, and as they were saying, they shot with a really tight schedule. Uh, they took a lot of advantage of the modular design and the versatility of the size of the camera, which is something I had already mentioned. You're going to see that that gets mentioned by just about every one of the filmmakers. Uh, it's allowed them to get lots of shots that they normally couldn't do, and it's allowed them to really do things that they never had the ability to do with other larger cameras. Uh, and of course, the lens choices really adds to that. They have the ability now using EF lenses to have very, very small lenses that would fit into a tight space, whereas a PL or a cine lens would be much larger even in the same focal length. 2398 is not exactly the same as 24P straight 24, which is what film is. This camera now affords you the possibility to use both independently. So you can match the frame rate of film, which is great for either cutting this stuff in with film or doing a film-based workflow. As far as the chroma keying and the processing and the codec, a lot of this, and this isn't just, not just these pieces, but the processing has a lot to do with how they got these visual effects to work so well. Um, when we had our event out at Paramount Pictures in Hollywood where we first announced this, one of the questions I got most frequently from people was, how can you really be getting the results that you're getting 
if this is MPEG-2 and it's only 8-bit processing, which is a really good question. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with what the XF codec is, it's MPEG-2, 50 megabit per second, and it's in an MXF wrapper. Now, I think the simple answer is, well, you have to watch the films, because I'm gonna stand here and I'm gonna explain it to you, and it's, so what, it's the company guy. And I said to everybody out at Paramount Pictures, I said, well, okay, you say you can't do that in 8-bit, but when you watch the features up on the big screen, did it look 8-bit? And universally, everybody said, well, no, it didn't. And pretty much the short answer is, because this is not your daddy's 8-bit. This is a little different. And it's not only due to what happens in the sensor, but it's a good segue into what happens in the sensor. And this is very unique. This is a new way of making color that's never been done before. The camera is gonna record 1920 by 1080, which is about 2.07 megapixels. However, we've got four times that resolution on the sensor. That, however, is not being used to create resolution. That's how we're creating color. So what we're doing, since we have, we have a Bayer filter, but we're not debayering the image at all. What we wind up doing is taking full raster, full bandwidth red, full bandwidth blue, and then double that on green. And the green is gonna be your luminance, which has a lot to do with the low light capability. And then having two offset green pixels has a lot to do with why the noise level is so low and also why it looks so organic. So what we're doing is before we even go into processing, we're taking 12 bits of red and blue and then 13 bits of green. So what we're starting with before we even go into the processing is completely different than the way color has ever been done before. On a traditional Bayer pattern large sensor camera, you are making interpolated color. So for every pixel, you're doing nine calculations of what's around it to try and figure out what that color is supposed to be. Here, we're taking true color, and then the camera is gonna process it similar to how it would process a three sensor camera. The advantage of this, not debayering, not demosaicing. Um, we've got, like I said, full resolution for every color. We use all the light across the sensor effectively. It allows for high resolution, minimal aliasing, and far greater sensitivity. It allows for a more effective and cleaner picture across the board. Along with this, one of the things I wanna mention is the sensor itself, the native ISO of the sensor is gonna be 640. It doesn't go any lower than 320. But for ideal, for the greatest dynamic range, we're gonna to wanna to have it at 850 ISO. And that would then be shooting in Canon Log, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. They also mentioned the Canon Log, which I had made mention of earlier. So uh, I'm just gonna to touch on this briefly to let you know the different kind of gamma options there are. Um, the Canon Log Gamma, this is pretty standard for what would be used for really high-end color grading. Uh, in a cinematic kind of environment. But we also have normal, which is gonna be a regular Rec. 709, what you would expect to get out of uh, a typical video camera, regardless of the design or the uh, uh, size of the sensor. Uh, and then finally, we have an EOS standard, uh, based upon pretty much the popularity of all of the SLRs, 5Ds, 7Ds, and so on, that have been used in a lot of cinematic production over the past few years. They have a very different color than your average video camera, so this kind of mimics that. For those of you that aren't familiar with what a log gamma does, it pretty much makes your picture look incredibly flat. Uh, what it's gonna do though, is it's gonna increase the amount of detail that you can maintain in both your highlights and in your shadow areas. It's gonna look very unsaturated, and it's gonna look, if you look actually at these different on-screen images, the one on the right is sort of imitating what it would look like without being corrected. And then there is a correction for the preview image, which only works on the camera. Um, there's no lookup table that's built in that you can look at externally. Um, it can be converted to 10-bit Cineon or other formats for post-production. So the idea here is that when you have a professional colorist, they're gonna be able to maintain a lot more detail and so that you can then create the color exactly as you want later. One of the other things that they used here was this wireless transmitter with the metadata input and the camera control and the exposure control, because they mentioned all of this in the behind the scenes, that's only gonna work if you have the EF mount version. The PL obviously is gonna be a completely mechanical and manual control over the lens. So there's not a whole lot really to say about this one. Obviously the camera's really durable. They were out in the desert, extreme temperature conditions, um, extreme lighting, that harsh bright light uh, of the sunlight in the desert and then doing some nighttime stuff. Uh, 
There's built-in glass ND filters on this camera, uh, 1 4th, 1 16th, and 1 64th. I'm not sure if they were employed in the desert, but I would have to assume that they might have been. Um, and the versatility and the size and the lens options. The only thing I could really talk about about this part of the film is uh, how hard it must be to shoot in those heat conditions in the desert, but I really don't want to talk about the cooling system and the fan, because even for a camera nerd like me, that's fairly dry. Do you have anything to add, Tim, since you were on the, the shoot here? So we did use the filters a lot. So actually, it's two stops, four stops, and six stops is what that works out to be, the built-in filters. And in this particular one, uh, about 80% of it also has a Sahara Gold filter, but that was the only filtering that was done at, at all. Um, the fan, as dry as that is, uh, it's kind of a nice option because we never ran into any dust problems. It's a sealed system. It's like a, a radiator system, so it's in and out. You cannot get to that chip with dirt. It's either covered in the front by either a 2, 4, or 6 filter or covered by a glass filter, so dirt never gets to that. And as far as the fan goes, it, it circulates around it, but it's a sealed system. Um, this shoot probably concerned me more than any of them in terms of, you know, living with 70s and 5Ds and overheating issues and things like that. And we never saw it. And we've got Russian arms and helicopters and um, chase scenes. And uh, we, we literally beat the crap out of these cameras. And we broke a lens, but we never broke the camera. But um, it, it went really well. So 2, 4, and 6, and the cooling system worked extremely well. Um, obviously, the big talking point on this is going to be the low light performance. They use that 20,000 ISO in that one courtyard scene a lot. Um, they use some special record modes that we have on the camera. There's interval recording, which would be kind of like your time lapse thing. Um, over and under cranking you can do. And then there's also uh, frame recording, which would be used for stop motion. They didn't use all of them, but obviously in that dual scene you can see that there's a lot of different time-based effects, which are all done in camera. 